Hello from the United States. Um, my name is Tiffany Roy and I'm going to be giving a presentation today about the recent advances in forensic DNA um, as a practice here in the US and across Europe. And uh, one of the first topics I want to address deals with how we assign weight to an evidence inclusion um, or match. So I think as forensic DNA analysts, we have recognized that not all DNA profiles are created equal. We can sometimes get from crime scene evidence, single source DNA profiles that can be obtained from blood or semen um, that are very descriptive and that tell us a lot about the person who may have left their DNA behind at that location. Um, but then also we can get some low level mixed DNA profiles that don't tell us a whole lot about who the person is that may have left their DNA behind or who, even whose DNA could have been transferred, whose DNA is in that mixture at all. So uh, for some background about some of the challenges that we face when we're interpreting mixed evidence, you could take a look at this TED talk by Dr. Dan Crane um, I have the link here in, in the presentation. But the, the base problem here is how will we translate to the judge or jury or whoever the trier of fact is in your system? How are you going to let them know which type of DNA profile you have in your case? Is it the type that's very strong evidence um, where we can say a lot about the person who left the DNA behind? Or is it a mixed profile that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, which end of the scale does that piece of evidence fall? Um, and we have to have some way of communicating this to the trier effect. Is this good strong evidence where we feel um, a high amount of confidence in the associations we're making or is this you know not so not so good? So in the United States we have used in traditionally uh, methods that were manual where an analyst would make a visual comparison between the peaks, in the evidence DNA profile and the peaks from a person of interest DNA profile and just see where the consistencies were or inconsistencies were. Um, and sometimes that can work depending on the quality of the DNA profiles. If you have very clean DNA profiles with a lot of DNA um, and they're not too heavily mixed and we don't have um, complicating factors like allelic drop in or allelic drop out, then um, you can look at a DNA profile and sometimes be able to tell the genotypes of the individual who may have contributed. But sometimes we can't tell that clearly. Um, and in this image, I show a picture of a DNA profile that has some peaks where there is consistency with the person of interest DNA, but there is also some inconsistency. And we really don't know which scenario is correct to explain the evidence. Um, is, it, is it evidence that's appearing by chance? Um, or is this truly some similarity between this person of interest and the evidence profile? So with our manual methods, when we make comparisons, we would assign some type of statistical weight to the association. Anytime we say a DNA profile matches a person or anytime we say a person is included in a DNA mixture profile, we have to attach a weight in the United States to be able to tell the judge or the jury if this is a strong association to that person or not so strong and that many other people might also be associated. Um, traditionally, we use a quantitative estimate to give our associations using the random match probability where we take the frequencies of the alleles that we find in our mixed profile and we multiply them together to get the profile frequency. It's usually reported in language that says the chance that a randomly selected unrelated person will match this evidence is X. Um, we, for mixed evidence, we use the combined probability of inclusion um, and so that also uses the product rule and we take all the alleles that we see in the profile and we multiply the frequencies in any combination. So it's focused only on the evidence alleles that we see in the evidence profile and the chance 
that um, anyone could have any combination of those alleles. It's still reported the chance that a randomly selected unrelated person will be included. The random match probability is primarily used for single source profiles where the combined probability of inclusion is for mixture evidence. Um, and we've started to move away from those based on their, their um, limitations. Um, the probabilities that we traditionally used do not address the uncertainty that comes with the DNA profiles we're obtaining now from very small amounts of DNA, from very complicated mixtures that come with a lot of uncertainty. Um, the random match and the combined probability of inclusion do a poor job of addressing the uncertainty that's associated with some of those profiles. So we can sometimes get over or under weighted evidence and that's not ideal. Um, to address this, the field started to move toward the likelihood ratio to uh, assign a probability to the evidence. And that's expressed as a likelihood of the evidence or the probability of the evidence given um, some set of hypotheses that we're gonna propose. So we're looking at propositions that usually are mutually exclusive. And in general, we usually propose what is the likelihood of the evidence if the suspect is contributing to the DNA profile um, compared to what is the likelihood of the evidence if a random person is contributing and see which one is greater. Um, so the limitations to these I just described are that it doesn't account for the uncertainty that comes with low level and mixed profiles. Um, when there's allelic dropout, it's not gonna, the calculation can't take into account, you know, the probability of any other allele being there when we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's missing. So we, we wouldn't really be able to properly address this missing information using um, random match probabilities. We have to be able to tell some genotype information um, when we're looking at a mixture in order to use a random match probability. So it's really limited to single source profiles or really clear major profiles. Um, and the probabilities of inclusion have a lot of limitations. They don't address the low level data and the possibility of dropout. If we have mixtures of evidence that has related individuals in it, mother, father, child, um, or, or brothers, um, then this calculation cannot apply. It doesn't apply to mixed evidence where related individuals are um, present or, or believed to be present. It only calculates the chance of a randomly selected unrelated person also matching. Um, we need complete data. If we're missing data and we don't know what we're missing, then there's a high chance that we could overweight the association of the profile to the individual. And we were underestimating the percentage of the population that would also randomly be included. And um, this calculation also has to assume that all of the contributors in the mixture are from the same ethnicity. So in situations where that's not occurring, we can't use the likelihood, uh, we can't use the combined probability. The likelihood ratio, a binary likelihood ratio has the same types of limitations. It doesn't work with the same if the mixture has calculate has uh, close order relatives in it. Um, it needs complete data. And it also assumes that all the contributors are from the same ethnic background. But to overcome um, the, the limitation as to the uncertainty in the data about the contributors, um, there have been software programs developed. And this one is from Australia or New Zealand. This is from the Environmental Science and Research um, in New Zealand. Um, so they've developed these software programs to address when we may be seeing dropout of peaks in a mixture, um, when, when we could be affected by drop-in. It's a, able to take into account probabilistically some of the uncertainty that we see in today's modern DNA profiles. So um, this program, uh, StarMix, is one of the premier programs that's being used in the United States. Um, I would say it's the, major the majority of public government laboratories are using this program. Um, 
if they are using probabilistic genotyping software, this is most likely the one. Um, it uses computer alg algorithms to deconvolute mixtures. And it makes adjustments for you know, uncertain data. It uses a mathematical algorithm called the Markov chain Monte Carlo in its analyses, which is a sort of hot and cold guessing game to model the data that's in the DNA profiles. Um, and it deconvolutes the profiles into its component parts and assigns likelihood ratio. It was developed, um, I, as I said, in New Zealand. And there's another program that also does something similar um, where it, it uses a computer program and algorithms to deconvolute DNA profiles. Um, this program is called the True Allele Program. It's developed by Cyber Genetics Com Corporation and they're a company from um, the US and Pennsylvania. And it makes adjustments for uncertain data as well. And it's, a, it's different than the first program because it wasn't developed by a government agency. It was, it's a private company that developed this. And there are some privacy issues associated with um, some of the algorithms and the computer mechanisms. So it's, I don't know as much about it as I would know about the StarMix program. Um, but the people who have developed the program, there's a lot online about it. They've made many videos and um, they have a lot of training material for free on YouTube and on the internet if you want to learn more about what the program does and how it can help with um, your profile interpretations for mixed profiles. Um, Euroformix is a free open source software that is widely used in Europe. And it was developed by a grant from the EU. Um, so it's totally free um, there. It also applies a likelihood ratio and it uses computer algorithms to deconvolute the mixture and break it into its component parts. It, it's able to make adjustments for the uncertain data where there might be dropout and it uses a maximum likelihood estimate, not the Mar Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, that's used by the StarMix program, STRMix. Um, so this is important in the United States because we are required to give a, a statistical weight, an estimate of weight to the jury whenever we associate a person who can, you know, can or cannot be included to a DNA profile. So if we're gonna say a person cannot be excluded, then we have to give a weight. If we say a person is included, we have to give a weight. If we say a person matches, we have to give a weight. So without that estimate of weight, the DNA profile comparison results would not be admissible in our court system. Um, and so we have some guidance, the international, um, there is some international guidance, ISFG, which is the International Society on Forensic Genetics. They published some guidance on doing this in 2006. Um, we have in the United States, our scientific working group on DNA analysis methods. They published some guidance in 2010 on doing this and our accreditation bodies um, have also published some guidance requiring the need for the, the statistical weight to be associated. And um, for the purposes of what we're doing, mixture deconvolution, interpretation of mixed DNA profiles tends to be very subjective if we're not using these computer programs. So the use of these computer programs to aid in the interpretation of the DNA profile is a much more objective analysis for mixture samples that can help prevent some errors. There are some limitations to the programs um, where it underperforms um, what, you know, maybe even a human could do. Um, so it's very important to understand what those limitations are, but it's a very helpful tool to assist in the interpretation of complex DNA mixtures and also to assign statistical weights to any matches or inclusions. Um, another interesting development in our forensic DNA system here in the United States is the use of genetic genealogy to solve crime and to identify um, unidentified remains, previously unidentified human remains. So this involves, um, you know, searching through private databases that are have accumulated from private companies doing DNA testing, like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. The type, that type of testing to 
demonstrate one's ethnicity, um, health screening, um, things that are available to the general public through that kind of testing. One thing I would want to point out um, is that the type of DNA testing that's being offered by some of these private companies who, who are involved in genealogy is not the same type of DNA testing that we use in forensics um, presently. So presently in the United States, we use short tandem repeat testing. And this is looking at short segments of DNA that has code that repeats a variable number of times. Um, these pieces of DNA are usually about two, three, four hundred base pairs long. Um, it's referred to often as junk DNA and that it's not been linked to any disease um, inheritance. We really don't know what the STRs, what the purpose of those non-coding regions are. So they're not affiliated with anything that might uh, reveal any private information about a person except for this unique identifying code. It's not linked to any physical appearance, health information, or ancestry. Genealogy testing is linked to that. So it's actual sequencing, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, and some of the providers of this type of uh, analyses, Parabon Nanolabs is a company that contracts out the testing um, for genealogy and for phenotyping. Um, and they use the alumina and finium cytosnip bead chip for their SNP testing. So this type of testing, the SNP testing needs a larger amount of DNA for the chip. Um, the call rates for the actual SNPs can be low and it's not the best for samples that are degraded. So when we're going back to some of these cold cases, they're finding that they're having difficulty um, in getting all of the profile information that they need for the genealogy searches. Um, it contains approximately 850,000 empirically selected SNPs, and these are located throughout the entire genome. Also, uh, as opposed to the SNP chip test, you can opt for whole genome sequencing of the evidence profile information. So you can take your piece of evidence that has um, the DNA that you're interested on it and send it to a laboratory that can sequence it. Um, and then you need a bioinformaticist to go through and mine the data that you're going to be using to upload to your genealogy database. There are several labs that perform this testing here in the United States. I have them listed here. One of them's Othram, one of them's Hudson Alpha. This type of whole genome sequencing is actually beneficial for the older samples, highly degraded samples. So it needs less input DNA and you get more information from degraded samples if you whole genome sequence rather than SNP chip. Phenotyping is looking at the SNPs and trying to derive physical information about the person who left the DNA behind from the single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so some of these SNPs have been associated with hair color, eye color, and skin color. Um, Parabon Nanolabs also asserts they can tell other information about face shape and freckles and, um, you know, body mass, things that, you know, are less well understood in the field and have less of a scientific foundation for. Um, but there is a scientist who also performs um, the three um, really well understood SNPs for hair color, eye color, and skin color at the University of Indiana at Purdue University. Her name is Dr. Susan Walsh, and she provides SNP testing um, for free for individuals who need that for their cases um, and subsequent genealogy searches. So the difference now is that in these genealogy investigations, we are focused on um, private databases and we're using DNA information that contains a lot of sensitive information about the person. Um, so it can give us information about their relatives. It gives us information about their ancestry and their hair color and their eye color. So it's, it's more sensitive data. We, for the genealogy investigations, um, we search different databases. So for our government and STR testing database, it's called CODIS. 
and it's maintained by the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation um, and each state. And so in order to have someone's DNA profile put into our government database, there are laws that require that when someone is arrested or convicted, they have diminished privacy rights. And so we enter their DNA profile into our government database. They don't get to decide whether they want to participate or they don't. Um, we just take their DNA once they violated the law and we put it into our database um, and they can't opt out or they can't remove their data. But in contrast, these new genealogy searches that we're performing with the SNPs, um, those are on privately controlled databases. One of the larger ones is owned by a company called Verigen now. Um, and this is consumer driven. They put their DNA profiles in there to search for their relatives or to learn more about their ancestry. Um, and there aren't any laws or regulations regarding government access to those privately held databases where people voluntarily take part in them. Um, private citizens are, have full privacy rights. They haven't violated the law and we don't force them to put their DNA into these private databases. The participation is voluntary and the consumer can opt out and remove their data at any time. So I know I mentioned 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Those companies do not allow law enforcement access to their databases at this time. Um, the only ones that allow law enforcement access are um, what's called GEDmatch, which is owned by Verigen, and Family Tree DNA. Um, and that's a database that has a working relationship with the federal government. Um, and you can take your DNA profiles from 23andMe and from Ancestry and you can enter them into these searchable databases if you wish to, um, you know, they call it opt in if you want to assist law enforcement in these types of investigations and private individuals can opt into these databases. Uh, it was most recently used in a, in a well publicized case I know this in 2018 was the DNA hit of the year. And um, the Golden State Killer is a prolific rapist and, and murderer that was active in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s um, in California. And through the search of uh, the DNA of some of his relatives, we were able to identify the DNA profile from some of the crime scene samples as belonging to this person. So they investigated um, you know, some people that had close relations and demonstrated um, genetic linkage to him. And then they looked to see in his family tree and in his family line, any individuals who could have fit the profile. Um, and then they investigated those individuals and took their DNA, performed STR testing to compare to the crime scene evidence. So this is an area of forensic science that's really up and coming. Um, we're really waiting to see how this will be used and what regulation it will be placed on this type of investigation and what types of privacy concerns um, the government's gonna express um, you know, constitutionally. So we're really waiting to see it's being used. It's been used in many cold cases and it's generating many leads. It's, you know, I, at least once a day I find an article in the newspaper about a new case that's been cracked by this forensic genetic genealogy searching. So definitely in the United States right now, the two most emerging technologies are the genealogy searches and um, probabilistic the use and um, employment of probabilistic genotyping software to interpret mixed DNA profiles and help us to overcome some of the limitations with that. So um, these are the two emerging topics I wanted to present to you here today, uh, sort of where DNA is going in the US, forensic DNA. If you have any questions about any of the information I've presented during this talk, I encourage you to send me an email. My email is listed on this last slide. It's tiffany.roy at gmail.com and you can feel free to um, reach out and send me an email with any questions you might have if you should want some additional information about these, um, these technologies. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for the opportunity for me to present here today to you all um, and have a great day.